Hi guys, I wanted to film a little bit of an intro for this podcast because it was such an interesting interview. Um, I've spoken to Peter Mayer for the last 45 minutes and we've been talking about his book, which is out on Amazon, Boy from the Wild, and his upcoming film, which is going to be released on Apple TV um, when this podcast goes live. Um, and Peter has done some amazing things in his life. He started off um, in Africa. He's been uh, to boarding schools in the UK. He went to Swiss Hotel School and he's had some amazing professional opportunities um, in hotels. And then he ended up going into um, films where he had some amazing conversations with Liam Neeson. And he's had some fantastic experiences that he's going to tell us about in terms of um, resilience, entrepreneurship, mindset. So stay tuned and check out Peter's book, Boy From The Wild, on Amazon and his film, Boy From The Wild, same name, coming up on Apple TV. <laughs> Welcome to the Akuno podcast today, everybody. We've got a special guest with us. We've got Peter Mayer. He is a director, an entrepreneur and just about everything else you could think of. Peter, how are you doing? I'm very, very good. Thank you so much for having me on. How are you? I'm good, thank you. And I'm very excited for this interview because you have had one of the most varied career histories I've ever seen. So I'm kind of keen to get you to start at the beginning and tell us how you got where you are. Uh, well, I mean, very, uh, a very fortunate kid, should I, should I say more than anything. Uh, I had very good, good parents and probably a, a lucky child to come into a world of what my parents had created. So I think it was kind of uh, an interesting journey was already presented before I chose a further journey. So I was uh, originally born and, and raised onto a game reserve in South Africa that my father started. Uh, so I grew up in the wilds and uh, surrounded by wild animals and sort of different kind of pets to what most people would have. So I, you know, my, my life started as an adventure already, uh, which was which was lovely as a child. But I also had the uh, the safari lodge itself. So you know, people would come and stay as guests in hotels. So. My father was was very much into property development, whereas my background was starting into the world of hotels. That was my upbringing uh, with my father. So I naturally progressed and uh, studied in hotel management in Switzerland. Uh, I then went and uh, opened and managed hotels all around the world, working for companies like uh, Hilton, Rosewood Hotels, uh, worked from places like uh, the Caribbean, the Middle East, Far East, uh, lived and worked all, all across the world. Um, it was only... About seven years ago, that my life sort of changed when I, I sadly had some family tragedy. Uh, I came back home to spend the last kind of couple of months with my with my father, and that was the end of hotels to me. I then uh, somehow got offered to to get involved in a commercial, in acting and and all of that. And uh, one thing led to another. I then ended up in film, and uh, I was on a set uh, with Liam Neeson on one occasion, and spoke about my story and what I wanted to pay tribute to with my father and. Uh, he was encouraging me to do it and then the brand and concept of the boy from the wild came about and uh, then wanted to make something else bigger so got into making a film became a sort of film producer director and uh, to finish it off I'm currently doing a, a photography studio in London so I own and manage that and help uh, help other people get into the industry and help their careers along the way so yeah very very varied a um, few other things in between but those are probably the bigger highlights I would say. So going back to when you're talking about hotels, is it as glamorous as people say it is? And what is it like training in hotel um, programs in Switzerland? It, well, it can be incredibly glamorous in the sense of how you want to how you want to manage it and, and the sort of travel and, and life that you can live with it. But, but like any job in life, um, you know, even for the big A-lister actors, you know, there's the good and the bad. And same thing within hotels. Studying in a place like Switzerland was was beautiful. Um, you know, we, we were stuck up on a mountain that was overlooking, you know, the sort of Swiss Alps and absolutely beautiful, you know, incredible environment, five star service. And we're learning that as well. And I think they they train you to be the best they call it the creme de la creme and it, it really was a, a great experience and something very worthwhile because it wasn't just about hotels it, it got me prepped for business period whatever industry it was going to be in um but the lifestyle for sure i mean i, I got to live in and travel to some incredible countries you know i was in jamaica dubai kuala lumpur you know throughout that you know five-star hotels luxury plus hotels you know worked alongside things with seven star influences so yeah there is a lot of luxury but it came with an incredible amount of hard work at the same time you know the, the industry is lovely but it's 
it, it, it can be very intense and unsocial too. What was the kind of um, catalyst that propelled you out of hotels and into commercials? I, it was the unfortunate um, uh, situation where my father called me with um, some sad news. He had he had cancer and uh, didn't really have very long to go. And my, my father was a hero figure to me and a sort of a best friend. And you know, I, I quit what I was doing in Dubai at the time and. Uh, you know, I left within two weeks. Was was back with my with my dad to spend whatever time I had left. Uh, you know, if it wasn't for him, I, I would still be in the industry. I, you know, I was at that time incredibly ambitious. You know, very high up in in, in my profession at that point. Uh, but it was yeah. You know, family comes first, and you only get your parents once essentially. Um, you know, particularly if you're lucky enough to still have your original parents. You know, I, I wanted to make sure that I was there for him at the end. You know, he he brought me into this world. I was there to help them out kind of a thing um but yeah the, it was not something where I, I i lost the energy it was just simply by family choice and then i think my priorities changed afterwards i'm interested in that kind of shift because there's a lot of us that work extremely hard especially as entrepreneurs and we can work to the detriment of um kind of our family and relationships um mm -hmm. where do you think the kind of line is as to is it an event that happens or is it just over time that you realize I mean obviously in your case it was an event but do you think there's a mindset shift at some point that kind of alters your priorities um to kind of make you think actually I need to spend more time with my family and doing things other things than what I'm doing right now absolutely uh but incredibly good question that I, I think I think for a number of people, it can be different to what's going on in their lives. But I think to every single one of us around the globe, we, we can all relate to a situation where maybe you get bored. Um, maybe uh, you've become fatigued for something. Maybe you need that kind of new spice in life to, to try and change something up. It, it's a little bit like how people go through promotions in their career. You know, they're trying something different. They're, uh, they're progressing, you know. So, Every individual will be different to what their needs are. And some people will stick in a job because they have a bigger necessity to, you know, maybe feed their kids or, um, you know, they, they've got some, it, it's a family business, you've got commitment to stay. I think for me, I had an event, but I, I don't think at any point that would have changed. I was constantly looking for different experiences, different challenges, things that kept me alive and vibrant and going through the things that made me happy. You know, I was an overachiever at certain points and, you know, it got me to travel. It got me to enjoy different things. But I think for some people, you know, it really depends on the circumstances. I, I think at some point I would have looked for another position uh, or whatever it was. But I think the thing that also can change for some people is you you grow up, you get older, you mature, you, you live through experiences. And then when, particularly when you kind of, I, I like to kind of say, look after the puppies, you know, it can be not just your kids, but it can be your team underneath you. And suddenly your puppies become grown. You, you realize that, wow, my team's grown. And I've grown. You know, you have a different perspective when you're giving back to people. It's not always about yourself. You know, I think your early days, it's like I, I, I versus we, we, we. And then, you know, towards the end, you focused on you, the other people, you know, family is always important. And I think, I was prepared to be away from home from a very young age. You know, my parents sent me to boys school from six years old. Um, I was used to being independent, but that also gave me a bigger calling to come back to them. You know, some of the people are there at home till they're 18 or some a bit longer. Um, but, you know, shifts come with, with a number of different, different reasons, but it's normally boredom most of, most of the time. We all want something fresh. So talking about challenges, um, how did you end up in commercials and what is it like being in a commercial? Well, getting into commercials and acting is, um, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say my comfort zone. I was very flattered and grateful that, that people wanted to use me. I mean, I, I thought, you know, that must be a, you know, it's an April Fool's every single day that I get a call for, for a job in a, in a commercial. Um, it's very, very interesting in the sense of how it works. I think I have a much bigger appreciation for the industry. You know, it, it's very interesting from a, an outsider's perspective, looking at vanity and realizing, you know, well, some people are just destined for the big screen. They're beautiful, they're talented, they've got that accent, whatever. Um, but sometimes you also realize, you know, how, how hard it is and, and what goes into it, you know, how, you know, performing can be, you know, very, very tough for some people. I, I was always confident, so I don't think I had a problem with making a fool out of myself. I probably do it far too often, so <laughs> I think I was used to it. But um, 
it's a it's an interesting industry it's it's challenging it's fun it's it's very competitive in a completely different sense from you know hotels and when you're building yourself up um but you, you know it comes with different pressures but it's incredibly exciting you know that it is the industry where you really are the one that kind of makes it you know whether it's through your looks whether it's through performance whether you are the one who's crazy enough to go out there to do the kind of performance that not many people would uh it, it's a very um self-rewarding kind of environment it, it can be very financially rewarding also don't get me wrong but i think sometimes particularly if you've got a role where you go i made that happen and, and that was all me you know it, it is nice to say i i've achieved something you know and it, it's 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 fun but it's not for everybody you know you have to be prepared for rejection in this industry a lot more than probably any other um, and that's not always about yourself it, it can be simply because i've got you know, different colored eyes to what someone else has, or my hair's short, someone's got long, you know, I'm six one, someone's five four, whatever, you know, there's always different reasons and you got to have a thick skin to deal with it. It can be really tempting to kind of look from the outside in and say acting's really glamorous and um, people are always dressed really nice and they're always being looked after and everything like that. But in the reality of it, what are the biggest challenges and the biggest takeaways that you've got from your acting career? it's really not what people think. I think that's the, the, the biggest thing of all. We, uh, like I was talking about earlier, it's very easy looking in at vanity from a, from a spectator's, you know, outcome and, and kind of seeing somebody walk along the red carpet or, you know, on the movie or on the front cover of a magazine, you know, people forget how much work goes into it. You know, I, I, I remember my first big film that I was an extra and that I was uh, very gratefully selected into a sort of small featured role. I was on Allied with, with Brad Pitt, and that was the first time I'd ever seen this huge set. Um, and we're in this warehouse at Gillette Studios in London, and you literally look as if you're walking into this, you know, horrible, someone's gonna murder you kind of a thing in this, this place. And all of a sudden, they've created this magical, you know, world of, of just Hollywood being Hollywood. But people are on set for hours. People are rehearsing for hours, weeks, months before. People are transitioning their bodies, you know, um, I don't think people see how hard it is to, to make a movie, how hard it is for somebody to maintain themselves. I mean, I've put on weight with COVID, but, you know, actors and all of that will go through, you know, realms of being noticed by every single person and the slightest pound that they put on, psh, the paparazzi is all over them. There's so many different sides to the world where people can look at it from a, a, an outsider and say, I wish I could have that. But in the reality, there's a lot of things that people don't. When it comes down to the pure essence of acting, however, it's lovely. It's so nice to get into character and sometimes take yourself out of yourself. Um, it's also a, a great way to, to challenge yourself in different ways. And for some people that are introverts versus extroverts, you've got opportunities to really get out there, but you have to be prepared for auditions, challenges, waiting for that call to come, which might not be days, it could be years for some people. Um, you know, and I certainly wouldn't say I've, I've reached that point where I'm out there and notice I just did it because I enjoyed it. And I was grateful to be on some big sets with some big actors, but people have to be prepared for, it's not what it's all made out to be. And nobody gets that kind of money unless you're prepared to really go the journey um, and, and do the hard work because it is hard. You know, it's not glamorous like people think, you know, they have moments or big events where it goes, wow, I, I want that you got to be prepared to work for that. You know, you want to look good, you got to make it happen. So drawing some parallels with um, some of the entrepreneurs that listen to this um, show, um, what kind of mindset tips have you got for people that are kind of working a lot, working very hard, trying to get to that level um, and just really kind of maybe almost burning out, but really just putting all of mm -hmm. themselves into it. Have you got any tips for those people? I, it really doesn't matter what industry. I mean, I think, you know, whatever you do, don't give up, you know, and don't don't give up on the industry. Don't give up on yourself is, is more what I mean. I think, you know, it, it's a little bit like a marathon. You know, I've uh, <laughs> I'm too overweight at the moment to do a marathon, that's for sure. But the point is, you always hear people are hitting the wall, you know, at that certain point, whether it's 18 miles in, whether it's, you know, 21, 22, just before the end, you've got to somehow break through those challenges. You You can't take failures um, and treat them like I'm a, I'm a failure. Failures can be your, your greatest success. Challenges that, that come can be the things that define you. And I think if people are prepared to really, you know, go through it the right way um, and not give up, they'll definitely be able to get to where they want to go. You know, I'm 
I, I'm fortunate to be where I am and I've had incredibly good parents that have got me to where I, where I am and, and good support. But, you know, there are times that you really have to look at yourself and, and push yourself. Um, and the other is, is be smart in what you do, you know, choose something that you're passionate about. Um, I was always of the mindset that, you know, I'm, I'm, my parents would always say, you know, Peter will do what Peter wants to do kind of a thing. Well, yeah, I do because it has, it has made me happy in what I do in life. And I think that's important for any individual, you know, people will challenge you because they might want a safer route for sure. I get that. But sometimes you have to live life as once and, and don't give up on the things that do make you happy. You know, if you, if you're happy in your job, you don't mind getting up at 4 a.m. to, you know, to get ready for it. People need to, to believe in themselves, don't give up, and do the right research to, to really help get them into the right position. You know, we're not all Einstein, we're not all know-it-alls. We do have to study sometimes. We do have to put in that extra period to, to say, ah, now I get it, you know, and then practice your skills. So I suppose we're going to have to address the Liam Neeson conversation because I think that's what everybody's <laughs> wanting to listen to. Um, so how did this come about? And obviously it spawned um, the, the conversation where you were encouraged to, you know, do your upcoming documentary and make success of that. But So how did all this happen? Um, I was, again, very, very lucky. I was um, selected to be on a, a film called The Commuter. Uh, I was just a, just an extra at the time, and anyway, they they kind of lined us all up, and I was selected for another featured part, and I was like, well, that's great, and they ended up spending about two weeks with Liam Neeson on a what looked like a New York train set in London at, at Pinewood, and anyway, him and I were on the set for quite a while, and uh, uh, I was obviously very professional at the beginning. I didn't go out my way and sort of say, hey, Mr. Neeson, what's up? You know, um, it was kind of like everyone's on set, everyone's like filming, like boom, boom, boom. He came up to me uh, with a, you know, I really like your boots. And I thought, well, that's an interesting chat up line. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll roll with this. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I was like, no, well, you know, I got them online. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't tell them that my mum had actually got them for me. <laughs> I didn't, I, I wanted to look cool with Liam. But um, no, it was a true story. I, I, he came out and asked about my boots. Anyway, we got to chatting. He, he was like, you know, where's your accent from? And et cetera, et cetera. And over time, we were just, you know, um, we had weird coincidences where I just managed to, you know, step on set and suddenly I got positioned with him. My next door neighbor, my mum worked with Liam Neeson on a, on a film called Rob Roy. And it was like, you know, suddenly he knows someone, I know someone, Liam and I are talking about this. And it was just a weird little world. And he was very fascinated by um, by my pictures and the stuff that I was talking about in, in Africa, my growing up and, and the loss of my father and what I wanted to do for him. And you know, I won't repeat the language, but, you know, he was kind of like, you know, screw it, you've got to go for it kind of a thing. Um, he's like, you know, who else has got a story like that on this train? And, uh, you know, and we had a couple of hundred people on set. And I was like, you know, it's true. It was it was a very rare upbringing. And when someone like Liam Neeson was kind of giving you that encouragement to, to go off and do the book, I was like, OK, I'm going to go for it. Anyway, I did. And essentially the rest is history. Um, but, yeah, it was it was it was a it was a small moment um, over a couple of weeks, but something that has really led me to to where I am today uh, in the sense of taking those steps, taking those, you know, moments of encouragement and uh, again, rolling with it. I didn't want to regret something. Did you write the book first um, and then have the idea to make it into a documentary or did you kind of think of it all at once? How did all of that happen? Deep down, I, I'd never really told the story for for a number of different reasons. And it, it was, my father had always wanted us to stay humble. I could have probably done this a lot sooner, but you know, it, 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 I wish my dad was here and I'd give it all back kind of a thing. But at that time, the book had a lot more essence. It had a lot more that you could kind of um, talk about. It was only afterwards that I, I was kind of thinking, you know, it would be great to create a trailer for the book, you know, to give people a visual of, of this kind of place of beauty and you know, what it is that wildlife is, is all about and how good this conservation story was. Uh, it was only when I was down there that, you know, there was the head of um, head of Disney and National Geographic for the Far East, who was just randomly a guest at that time. And he was just like, you know, wow, what a story. He, didn't, he had no clue. He was sitting there having his breakfast while we were chatting. And he was immediately excited by it and just the, the richness of how this place came about. So it started with the book got interest got bestseller in, in amazon in different categories so then i suddenly thought you know this is this is going somewhere let's make something let's listen to other people's advice um and again roll with it i i didn't want to regret it so 
I got together a small film crew and, you know, we, we put something together, but I, I wanted it to be visually um, good that it could explain to enough people what it looked like. Uh, and, you know, now we, we made a, a documentary out of it. It's not long. It's, it's kind of short and sweet, but it comes with a, a very strong message in, in different categories. But the book gives a lot more detail. And it also, in your situation with, with you know, people in, in their careers, it probably gives a lot, a lot more essence to how to go about their careers. Um, but, yeah, it, it was book first and the film after. How did you um, decide on the title? And then um, how did you kind of decide what kind of time period and how you were going to kind of construct that? Well, I was originally looking at something called Returning Home a Boy. Um, I wanted to create the kind of going back to Africa after losing my father and, and literally being that kid again with excitement and adventure. But then I, I, I oh, I'm so sorry, there's a dog outside causing havoc. Um, <laughs> um, it, was, it was a case of, um, do you need me to go shut the door? Oh, be all right. Yeah, you can do, yeah. Give me one sec. Um, uh, so, where were we? Sorry, the question was... Um, how did you decide on the title ah, the of the title. book? Yeah, sorry. So, originally I was looking at um, returning home a boy and kind of going back to my, my roots and kind of being that kid again and, you know, just making sure people realise that, you know, we've always got that kid inside of us, you know. But then I realised, you know, we needed something more commercial to really kind of get that story into a much bigger light that wasn't just about the place but the stronger messages about conservation or family or whatever so I came up with with the boy from the wild and from its literal sense of I grew up in there enough to kind of tease people to pick it up and have a look and then read it from the back you know and then kind of go wow okay I wasn't quite expecting that or you know all the different avenues so it was really from a commercial aspect taking the the literal sense of I was from there growing up and you know first footprints were kind of in that you know in that wild so that's why I came up with it. And how did you kind of decide on what time scale to use within it did you kind of think about um, a boy growing up or did you want to go through a longer period of time how did you kind of box that in? Well it was <sighs> It was really kind of the, the ghostwriter, um, Graham Spence, who, who gave me a lot of kind of advice and, and wisdom behind it, you know, because we could have created something of, of just growing up in there and, and stopping there. But I think there was, for me, there was a much bigger message from growing up in the wild than just the stories of like, oh, I went here, I did this, and this animal attack, or this snake bite, or this beautiful moment. It was a case of, if I'd gone through the time scale from birth until now, you're able to get a sense of how you can look back in some of the lessons. So when I worked in hotels in different cultures, how can the wild teach you certain things of handling that situation? You know, it isn't just kind of being out here in, in London in what I call the concrete jungle. The wild jungle can also prepare you for that. I wanted the timescale to go, to go further to really bring people back to how it relates. But at the same time, how important it is growing up in an environment like that, you know, and maybe a lot of people would like that. Not many, you know, would, would say that they wouldn't, I would imagine, but it's a case of how, how we can bridge a completely different message that's not normally told. You know, we always learn about, well, this animal does this or protect them due to poaching, but people forget that actually we were wild ourselves once. You know, how can we bridge this? And that's, that's really why I wanted the whole time scale to, to be, in, you know, incorporated. And how did you kind of then move on to... Um making a documentary because that's a really big step from writing a book to then doing a whole kind of documentary film crew discussing you know all the different aspects of this story how did you make that jump um it, well i mean it's, strangely it was a lot simpler than the book um the book takes a lot more time it's a lot more effort um the film was just quite simply i wanted to create um a visual of, of what it was it was only when i was down there that you know as i said we, we met the um uh, the head of National Geographic and, and Disney just on vacation, you know, they were giving advice along the way. I, I wanted to then kind of create something that was bigger. And I think having that, that encouragement and that opportunity, I'd had enough sort of business experience to understand the process. I'd spent enough time in film to kind of get a look around to realize, you know, how it works. Where I was very new was then how do I get the film out there? So I think I'd had a, enough of idea how to make it, but again, not necessarily perfect. I'm sure there are things that I could have done better or, or learned a lot more. Uh, but I was on a tight budget with a 
very very short time time frame and uh you know i i took the opportunity you know it was it was kind of worth it so jumping um from one to the film uh the film wasn't as hard where it's been different is like for example now you, you asked me when's it on um apple tv you know that 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 was a process of okay i've got the film now how do i get it from you know i've got from a to b how do i get from b to c now you know how do i get from c to d where everyone around the world gets to watch it you know that's been a learning curve and and that's something that you just kind of go with the flow you know if, again following your question of how can you you know tell people if they're if they're in a rut follow your dreams go after it you know find a way you've got to learn and and that's basically what i've done and i'm still in that so you know it's quite nice to have jumped because i'm i'm still on that little journey and you've got some really nice messages in there about conservation and, and growing up and learning life's lessons um so it's, it's it just sounds like a really really interesting life story that we could all benefit from uh well thank you i mean i i appreciate that i like I said, I, I was very lucky to grow up into it. It wasn't by by choice. And I think, you know, some people try and win the lottery. I'm still trying to win the lottery. Don't get me wrong. You know, same as everyone else. But I definitely won the lottery in the sense of parents that gave me a, a phenomenal environment. You know, I, I know that I'm, you know, possibly one in, you know, a couple of billion for sure that would have had something that as lucky as I did. So I think it was only fair to, to give back where I could but the, the biggest thing about the book and the film is to, it's paying tribute to my dad um, that was that was always the key for me it wasn't to show off about you know how how cool it was to live here it was really about the importance and you know paying tribute to a man who gave so much in return you know my, my father was a very very successful businessman but he he always gave back and, and he gave back for wildlife he gave back for friends and family and etc cetera, etc cetera. he created experiences that people would never forget. And he created a life where, you know, animals were able to repopulate and have kids of their own and so on and so forth. You know, I wanted to to tell that story and, and pay tribute to the man who really started it. You know, I think when you can give different messages from how to live in that environment to how to survive that environment, to how to relate it to your real world. I've, I've always said, it's relating the wild jungle to the concrete jungle, you know, prepare yourself uh, in different ways and my environment gave me different lessons that have allowed me to use it um but the other message is how you respect your your family your parents and that was something i really wanted to bring across you know something that is some we often do far too late in our lives um and you know I, I tried my hardest before my dad passed but i've definitely done a lot more since he's passed um it's really just encouraging people to to realize about what's important well, Peter, we're coming to the end of our interview, but your book, uh, The Boy from the Wild, is on Amazon now, and your film is coming out on Amazon TV. It should be out by the time this podcast airs. Are there any final thoughts that you want to leave with our listeners, and would you like to tell them where they can find you as well? Uh, well, hopefully it'll be on Apple TV. Um, it's, what? Oh, uh... did I say Amazon TV? Yeah, it's okay. Oh, God, I'm <laughs> Apple TV, sorry. <laughs> no problem, no problem, it's all cool. Um, so yeah, the, the book is on is on Amazon at the moment. Uh, the film is hopefully uh, very shortly going to be on Apple TV. So wherever they are in the world, they, they should be able to watch it. Um, but if they want to find more information, uh, they can go on to petermayer.com. Uh, they can go on to uh, my Instagram page from The Boy From The Wild or Peter Mayer Actor. Uh, so yeah, d different ways to, to get a hold of me or simply just Google. Gosh, that's pretty much all that people have to do now. It's amazing how the world is kind of opened everybody up to to everyone else and we will link all this down below so you can just go and click straight through to find peter and his book is out on amazon and his film is out on apple tv so make sure you click through and watch and read and enjoy the story because it's fantastic thank you so much for being a guest today peter it was a pleasure thanks for having me <laughs>